Today's video is brought to us by Firearms Legal Protection. Firearms Legal Protection is a legal defense program for lawful gun owners with a 24-7 emergency hotline and plans designed specifically for self-defenders. They are offering a discount on their plan to ASP fans, so hit the link in the description for that. Mark, again, thank you so much for coming here. I, I tell people all the time, listen, you know, as an attorney, you charge hundreds of dollars an hour and you're willing to educate. And you do this all over. You go to gun shows. I love this stuff, man. It's fun to talk about. And I think it's good. It's a good public service. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we want gun owners to be responsible, right? Yeah. We don't want them making us look bad. Because as you and I know, the vast majority of gun owners are reasonable, responsible, mm -hmm. measured people. It's the idiots that we're trying to um, slow down or stop or maybe educate because they're the ones giving us all a bad name. Yeah, ain't it the truth? And we don't, you know, we don't need help. Thanks, guys. But so uh, Las Vegas Metro, you've watched the video. We've watched the video together. Um, and, and clearly in this case, guy goes to draw a firearm on cops who had him at gunpoint. I mean, lunacy of the highest level. Mm -hmm. But what I wanted to talk to you about is that the second badge cam, the officer there didn't shoot. But if he had, which... Is, it was kind of surprising to me that one officer shot and the other ones didn't, but they didn't, and that's fine. Uh, but if he had shot, that shot would have clearly been in the back. And I hear a lot of people say, you can't shoot someone in the back. That's not legal. What are your thoughts on that? You know, my thoughts are, this is why we can't really make bright line rules in these situations. Because, you know, self-defense turns on the question of whether or not what was done was reasonable mm. under all of the circumstances. Now I can tell you that most of the time, if you shoot somebody in the back, you're gonna have a problem with that. Why? Because the argument is, well, it wasn't really an imminent threat. You shot them in the back. However, um, you can have a cir circumstance when it is an imminent threat. And without even getting to this yet, yeah, just this past year, we had someone who came into our office, they were arrested on a first degree murder charge. Uh, the, the, prosecutor wanted to look at it closer like they often do and so the charges didn't proceed and we went into this period of investigation the shot was in the back mm. it was in the back but uh, we went and we retained an expert and they did some work on it and the argument was similar to the situation here which was the person who got shot in the back was carrying a firearm and there was an imminent threat because you know just because someone is turning their back to you doesn't mean in a fraction of a second they can't turn around and go like this. Yes. And when you're looking at the video, um, it's pretty clear from the video, it seems that the police officers knew this guy was armed. Clearly. He's it, openly carrying a gun. He's openly carrying a firearm. This guy's armed. He, he's, he's got the hands up, right? So they, he's clearly aware that the police have got him now at this point. When he reaches down, it sure looks like he's going for the gun. Clearly. You're probably a second away or less from this guy turning around and starting to blow rounds at the officers. And it's, it's unreasonable to say that the officers have got to wait until this guy turns around right. and he can get a shot. That's just not reasonable. At this point, we got enough data, right? We have enough reasons to think that the guy who they shot is an imminent threat to use deadly physical force against the officer. So sh this was a good shoot for that reason, in my opinion, even though had he been shot in the back, it wouldn't have made any difference to me because you had an imminent threat of deadly physical force. Makes me wonder why the guy who got shot, how he was so stupid. He must have been on drugs yeah, or something just, like I mean, how, Did you really think? I, you right, were going to outdraw three cops that were all drawn down on you? Starting no. with your back turned to them, no less. And, and that could have very well been what they call suicide by cop. You could know what been. I mean? Very well there. And I, I've seen other instances that we've had on the channel of uh, you know people making the decision to shoot and because of human performance factors. By the time the shot goes off, the guy has turned quarter or half away. And so it can, but you're, I, I think what you said earlier, I want to reiterate, is that most times, if you shoot someone in the back, you're going to have a problem with imminence. I think so. And so you, you, generally speaking, again, what you have to be able to articulate is, I, I had an imminent threat of great bodily harm or death, and that's why I shot. And we don't want you to articulate this at the scene to the police, right? It's important to articulate the fact that you can articulate anytime you want, right? right? So it's better to wait until all the data comes in, talk to your lawyer, you maybe don't make any statements. Sometimes I like to surprise the prosecutor with my defense right there in the middle of the trial. 
Other times I like to put it out there in advance and say, hey, here's the situation. Maybe you shouldn't charge the guy or maybe you should charge him with something less serious than you were originally thinking. So let the lawyer make that decision. You get to talk anytime. I don't like these sort of canned responses about anytime you're in a yeah. shooting, here's what we want you to say. I was in fear for my life or something like that. Once you say something like that, you're locked in. Yeah. What if that's not the reason you shot? What if you shot because you were trying to protect a third party? To, to, uh, to sort of rattle off the canned, I shot because I was in fear for my life. You just messed up your case. Because when you get on the stand in your trial and say, well, the reason I shot was because I was trying to protect this guy. Well, the response back is, well, didn't you say to the police officer at the scene right, right. at the time, I shot because I was in fear for my life. But you weren't. Now you're saying something different, so what happened? So always watch what you say, right? We, we, we really have talked about that a lot. And what you say is something like, I want my lawyer present. Right, I, I'd like to have my lawyer present for all questioning. No questions without my lawyer present. Yeah, you know what it's important <clears throat> to note on this too, that the law has evolved in a way where you have got to be definite about it. If you're equivocal in any way, mm. if you say something like, well, you know, I think I better have my lawyer present, that's not gonna do it. Hmm. If that's what you say, I think I like to have my lawyer. That's not going to be good enough. The cops are going to continue to question you and keep working on you. You have not in, invoked your right to have an attorney present. You've got to be definite about it. I want my lawyer present not, uh, before I answer any questions, huh. something like that. Because any little equivocation in there will change the analysis, the legal analysis in court. But And so in this case in particular, though, I mean, obviously, the, the man ended up being shot in the thigh because the officer needs some work on his marksmanship skills. But uh, the shot in the back would have been 100% justified because of the totality of the circumstances, because right. they were an imminent threat of death from the guy drawing a gun and shooting them. From what I see here, that certainly seems clear. And, and therefore, again, it's not about where you shoot someone, it's about why you shoot them. And it's about, it's really about, all of this boils down to one question. Was it reasonable with what the defendant did, considering everything, considering all of the facts and circumstances, right. the facts about the defendant, what's the defendant's stature, what options did the defendant have, what did the defendant believe incorrectly or correctly about the facts, what was the distance involved, what was the disposition of the other person, what was going on around in the area at the time, all these various things. And, you know, creative lawyers come up with lots of arguments, you know, as Monday morning quarterback. Well, you could have done this, you could have done that, you could have done the next. So you're going to be subject to all of that. And then at the end of this big, huge trial, really all we say is, hey, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, tell us if the defendant was reasonable. Right. So it's not about if I thought it was reasonable. Right. It's if these 12 people who were chosen on the jury or eight people, depending, you know, whatever, do they believe that that was reasonable? Yeah, to be precise about it, you know, when somebody asks us, and inevitably we both get asked with, about these types of questions. Okay, say this happens. You know, this happens, this happens, this happens, can I shoot him? Uh, and usually they're close calls because people come up with hard questions, right? And so the, the question really isn't what do I think or what do you think? The question is more like, hey Mark, I'd like you to predict for me what a randomly selected group of jurors from the mm. local community will think. Well, that's a lot harder prediction. That is, for sure. They come up with some odd decisions. And, and you don't know who you're <clears> going <throat> to get, right? Because every community has a bell curve spectrum of people who are eligible to get on the jury. you got people on one side who, who don't understand why there are still people who aren't carrying firearms. Mm -hmm. Then you get people on the other side who don't understand why anybody gets to carry a firearm. And there are people like that. I, I ask those types of questions when I pick a jury. I say, raise your hand if you think the gun laws are you know, too tough or not tough enough. And they raise their hand and then I ask them questions. Inevitably, there are people in the crowd who will say, I don't understand why if you're not a police officer, you have a gun at all. Right. This isn't a time for me to get into a debate. I say, thank you very much, and we write the name down. <laughs> Let's get rid of this person. But you know, you should be aware too, the person who comes up on the jury and says, I'm a life member of the NRA and I support the Second Amendment, they're gone. Yeah, on so these kind of cases for sure. So you're going to get someone in the middle who you don't have any idea. This could be somebody who, who thinks badly of you just because you're carrying a firearm. Mm. You don't know. So again, so caution again. why take the chance? Why, if you can avoid the problem, mm -hmm. and you can't always, to be fair, you can't, life finds you, right? 
when, like the, uh, some of the other videos we've watched, people get out of a car and they stick a gun in your face, whatever. You're confronted with the problem and you gotta act. But if you have an option, if you're at the front door and you're secure in your home and the problem's outside, shut the front door and shut call the, the cops. Shut the front door, yep. But if you have to, again, if that threat is there and is an imminent threat, the shot in the back could be justified, but it isn't often, so watch that stuff. Mark, man, appreciate the knowledge, my friend. Thanks for having me.